Okay. So yeah, so how many of you watched the video? Uh, and how many of you started with Haskell? One. Uh, and, and online people, you can use chat. So nobody, not yet. Still doing Golang. Okay, so people started with Haskell, but not with the video. One person looked at the video. Great, Malin has also started. So it would be best if you can uh, watch the videos before the class, because then you can ask me questions, right? So let's do that for the next one. Uh, let's do that for Wednesday. So if you could watch the one which I posted for today and for Wednesday, then you can kind of catch up. Uh, we are a little bit behind with Haskell. Uh, we had uh, extra material related to profiling and extra material um, you know, related to Golang. So we are a little bit shifted. So I posted the video lecture three uh, for today, uh, but we will kind of talk about it today and I will spend more time on it. Uh, and then uh, we will do what was posted on Wednesday, we will do next week. So the Wednesday one, you don't really have to watch yet. Just watch the one which was for today. Um, it is important for, for everybody to set up uh, the Haskell environment. And it is it, it, the same with, as with Golang. It's a little bit of a, for some of you, might be a bit of a messy business. Uh, so the, the first thing is we use Stack. Uh, Stack is like a, a management environment for uh, Haskell. And it will par partition your dependencies and your Haskell compiler in kind of a per project basis, right? So it's like a mechanism for making it more uh, flexible and more kind of easy to manage if you all use stack. Um, there are kind of a two main mechanisms for managing dependencies in, um, in Haskell. Uh, so you have the basic compiler with the standard libraries. And on top of that, you have what's called Cabal, which is sort of like a modules in Golang, right? So it's kind of a system for managing dependencies and managing the other uh, projects. And on top of that, you have Stack. And Stack is using kind of Cabal and underlying infrastructure underneath, but it's sort of the highest level, like it's, it's the most, most flexible one. So um, there are some, um, some links on the wiki uh, where you can um, read like how to install Stack. And then once you install Stack, you will have it in command line, so you can initiate new projects, um, and you can um, you can install extensions for your uh, IDEs, uh, and then you will have um, the whole environment sort of ready. So let me demonstrate that. So if if we make a big is that readable? So uh, if you say stack, uh, let's say version. Um, I'm using, so let's say stack upgrade. So I, I was using a very old one. Uh, the current version is 2.7.3. Two So I have to okay, so that worked. So if I do start version now, I have 2.7.3. So whatever version you install, you can always say stack upgrade and then it gets you the latest one. Uh, and then to initiate new projects, I usually keep projects in um, uh, projects folder, and then I have a project or proc. Row six. Yeah. So if I do git pull, you will see that I posted. Um, yeah, I don't have my so SSH at ID. Where is my key again? Okay. 
I initiated two um, two projects yesterday. Uh, one is Hello Haskell, which we will talk today about, and then the lecture three is the one which the video was talking about. So all the code which was on the video is kind of already in the repo, um, and the, there is an extra extra logic which we will talk later on. Uh, it's about like doing a, a little interpreter for expressions. So you don't need to deal with that that math lecture three math yet. Uh, but the code, which is kind of in the lecture, is already there. Um, and then Haskell, hello Haskell, is like a, um, a neat, very simple setup for all the tests. And I will cover it. I will cover it today. Um, so anyway, so if you kind of in the, you, if you have Stag already installed, you can say start new and then say some name. Uh, and then it will kind of configure your GHC uh, compiler and all the dependencies kind of automatically. And then you, you can kind of easily uh, run it, right? So if you like, I've already done it. So if you say stack new hello Haskell, uh, so it kind of created the project for me. Uh, and then if you go into that folder, um, so if you, do stack new, you will have this kind of package created for you for yourself. And if you go there, so if you say hello Pascal, then you can say stack, and then you can kind of build it, you can run it, you can do certain operations on it in from command line. Um, for editing code, of course, you, you would use code. Uh, so I have a code um, plugin for Haskell. Uh, I think there is only one. I didn't check before the class, um, but I think there is only one Haskell plugin for, let's see. So I have Rust. Haskell. What do I have? Um, I think that's the one that you should have installed. It seems I don't have it installed. Maybe I haven't installed it for this laptop. Um, so I have Go, I have Rust, I don't have Haskell installed. So yeah, so I think the one that you want is the one called Haskell. And then once you install it, uh, you will have kind of an extra support in, in code for, uh, for Haskell. And then it will kind of uh, link with the uh, underlying uh, installations that you have. Um, so if I open the code, yes, it does syntax highlighting and it's sort of, it's already installing the Haskell server and all the additional things. So it will kind of do it for you. Like the, I hope the installer will, the installer of the plugin. So the plugin that you want is the Haskell plugin. Um, and then uh, once you open some project or open a Haskell file, it will kind of initiate um, all the things that it needs to do. Some things take a bit of time. Uh, so the very first time you generate stack new and new project, when you will be kind of building it or testing it, it will take some time. Um, Haskell is not as swift in compiling as Golang is. And also the dependencies are kind of more complicated. So it tends to be kind of a longish process to build or test things. Um, other than that, it's kind of very similar. So once, once you install uh, the extension, you will have kind of a syntax highlighting and extra, extra things. So I, I will come back to that in a minute. Um, and then let's see. So Haskell stuck. I, th I think it's called, um, yeah, Haskell stack. So if you go haskellstack.org, then that's where the home is and that's where you can uh, get the, uh, the initial scripts or initial binaries for the for stack. 
And once you install it, then as I said, um, you, will, you will be able to upgrade it yourself. Um, and then uh, one of the neat things is that everything that you do is kind of um, uh, mediated through the stack version control and the, the, the versions that you're running the, uh, the compiler. So for example, the compiler is called um, Glasgow Haskell compiler, GHC. And then you can uh, check what version I have kind of installed globally. And globally, I have a version 8.4, which is kind of older. Uh, but in my project, in my Hello Haskell project, I'm using kind of a newer compiler. So if I say stack GHC version, version uh, then uh, I typed something wrong. GHCI, let's say. Uh, and... Yeah, maybe this one. Yeah, so it says, because I on this laptop, I didn't run this project yet, uh, but it already tells you uh, that I'm running GHC 8.10.7, right? Um, yeah, so it will kind of uh, use a different, um, a different version of the compiler depending on the setup of your, of your project. Uh, so it, it, it is a little bit more complicated than in Golang. Uh, and also, but it's at the same time, a little bit more partitioned. So same as like with Golang, you have all the modules and all the dependencies per project. Uh, so you can use the modules and you can have different dependencies on an external library in this project differently than this project, but you're still using kind of your global compiler, right? That your global Golang compiler. Here, you don't use the global compiler, you use kind of a compiler per, per setup, right? Um, and it takes some time. So as I said, because I didn't run it before, it's kind of a taking time and I'm on the, um, on, on, on the Wi-Fi network. So I will not actually be doing that now. Um, I do it in the break, uh, but you, you get the idea that you have kind of a compiler per project. And then this is the, the page where you get your installation. And then if you have problems, then let me know. Um, so let's start. Uh, you can ask me questions in, in chat um the the zoom people and you can also ask me questions in in life and in um in the mentimeter so let's see how the menti will work i just need to get to the remote controller One. All right, so let's go. Oops, don't scroll so fast. Uh, it seems I clicked multiple times. Right, so you can ask me questions and then the first poll is about who will be coming to classes. Um, um, we have kind of a strong incentives to make you come to classes. So our bosses told us that we have to work hard to make you come to classes, right? Uh, so I hope uh, you prefer coming to classes and I hope you will come. Um, last year, we had a bit of a problem. So about 30% people were coming to classes and the rest were still uh, attending the classes from home. Um, it, is, it feels a bit more convenient to stay at home and to kind of uh, just jump into Zoom and participate in the class in Zoom, but it has a lot of disadvantages. One disadvantage is that you cannot kind of interact with other people in the class and you cannot ask questions kind of freely and you cannot chat with me. Uh, and that means you will kind of learn a bit slower. So the people who were kind of doing the learning from home, 
at the end of the year, they kind of observed that they were not as productive and they were not as motivated and it was benef you know, beneficial to come to classes. Um, so those of you who prefer being at home, uh, even though you prefer being at home, consider coming to, to physical classes. Uh, it has some psychological benefits and also it allows you to interact with others and ask questions and work together and, and, and so on. So it has kind of a, a lot of benefits. Um, so I can see like the, the only some people prefer online lectures. I, personally, I prefer online lectures myself. Like uh, when I could stay home and just watch it online, I kind of felt it, it's better. I'm a little bit introverted as well. So I don't need kind of to be in the classroom. Uh, but I think there are kind of benefits of, of coming physically to classes. Um, if you cannot come, if you like taking the course remotely, of course, that's no problem. Um, you, you continue doing what you have to do, but if you can come, please come. So I can see we should be okay. Um, also, they, they uh, reduced the rule. Like last year, we couldn't come, like everybody couldn't come because there was some limits of how many people can be in the classroom. Those limits are lifted, so we can be crowded in the classrooms now if we have to. Um, Okay, so Haskell, um, we using Haskell as an example, you probably most likely not gonna use Haskell in your professional life. Uh, I don't use Haskell a lot, um, but Haskell is a very good language as a um, language to learn ab about certain concepts. And that's why we're using it. Um, and we're using it mostly to teach you about functional programming paradigm. You already know structured and kind of object-oriented programming, uh, but you don't know a lot about functional, probably. Uh, and this course will kind of fill the gap. Um, it's common to have functional programming as a theme in universities. And we have we had students taking kind of a more advanced programming courses in Trondheim. And um, one of the comments which I got from students was that they've used OZ, which is another uh, multi-paradigm programming language. I learned OZ when I was a student as well. Um, and it's quite neat, um, especially not, not for functional programming, but for constraint-based programming, such that you can solve certain problems by setting up constraints, and then the solver will kind of solve the problem for you. Uh, it's very, very nice uh, way of programming certain types of problems. Um, but OS feels very academic. It's a very uh, primitive kind of um, support and tooling, and it feels kind of, uh, you know, um, cumbersome. And Haskell is not. In fact, Haskell is it kind of has a very, uh, a very modern feel to, to itself uh, because um, it has, um, the programming environment is, is kind of very nice. It's very similar to how you would program in Rust or in Golang. It has every, all the batteries kind of included. Uh, it has a very good um, interaction, like in integration with uh, various IDEs. It has the kind of uh, command line uh, interpreter that you can play with. You can uh, run certain things and do certain tests in command line um, such that it feels, um, very um, interactive in a sense of you testing out some of the things before you try them out. Oh crap, I don't have the interpreter. Uh, so I, I really do need to do this one. So let, let's that continue uh, while I, I talk. Um, and then it has, oops, wrong button. Um, it has, Um, very good online documentation and uh, for, for things that you kind of need as a programmer to look up quickly. So Google, um, not Google, is like a search engine for Haskell uh, and it allows you to check uh, all the functions or all the things that you uh, are learning about in kind of a single place. So Google is very powerful and it allows you to kind of ask questions um, about functions. So for example, if you want to learn about the function length, 
uh, well, you know, it's, um, it describes you exactly what the types are and what the function is. And like, if you, if you jump to it, it usually gives you examples of how a particular function is used. Um, so if we wait a little bit, we can see that length returns the size length of the finite structure as int. So it returns the size of whatever the structure is as int. Usually we, we use it for lists, uh, but it can be uh, some sort of dictionary or, or some other things. And it kind of gives you how you use it. And like length of an empty list is zero. And then, you know, a, a length of this ABC list with ABC being characters is three and so on, right? Uh, and then if you ask it, what's the length of the infinite list? Like here, I have a list which starts from one and goes on into infinity. Well, it will hang, right? It will keep counting how long that list is. And because it's infinite, it will never give you an answer. Uh, and you can see in which package the, the function exists, since what version. Uh, and also when you, when you check it at the beginning, you see it's in the base package, but it's also in the prelude. Um, so it, it's a little bit confusing because um, Haskell, same as other uh, systems, it has a certain libraries which are kind of built in, like which are part of the standard library, and some which you need to import. Right, so for example, data.list is a kind of a package which you need to import to be able to use the functions which are in that package. Uh, but the base package is sort of the one which exists uh, by default in the runtime system the moment you in instantiate it. But there is a, another concept. There is a concept of prelude. And prelude is kind of like a combination of different base packages which are kind of uh, existing, which are mapped into the namespace of the default interpreter or the, the default compiler the, the moment you boot it, right? So some functions in the prelude are not in the base package, but they will be in the prelude because they are so commonly used that they are in there, right? So you may have some functions, for example, from data list, uh, which in, exist in the data list, but they are kind of uh, remapped in the prelude. So prelude, you can uh, think about it as sort of like an alias system where you have some functions exposed to you by default. Um, and then everything that is here is kind of, you don't need to import it, uh, same as with the base. So prelude and base, you don't need to import them uh, because they kind of exist for you by default. Um, so that's, that's Google. So you can search for functions. You can also search uh, for packages. So you can kind of find what's inside the base package uh, by searching like base. And then you will see all the functions and all the constructs which are kind of in a particular package. But you can also have searches like you can say, I want to find all the functions which take uh, an int as a parameter and return a string, right? And then it will search by, by type. It will give you all the functions which have this signature, which basically take an int as a parameter and return a string. So um, you have, for example, show int. Uh, so show int con converts an integer into a string and it exists in this particular package and it does what, what it says it does and so on. Uh, so sometimes, for example, if you like uh, want to find a particular function and you know it takes a string and a string, and a string and returns a string, then you know replaces that function, right? Because it takes uh, what pattern you want to replace with what pattern from which string, and it returns you the final string, right? So this is kind of like uh, if if you know what you want to achieve, sometimes you can find the function by not knowing the name, but knowing what it does, right? So we kind of know we need to have a string, which is like a, a pattern, which will be replaced by the second one. And then we have the source string. And then the final thing is what we get out of this, right? Um, and then uh, replace exists in the foundation package. Uh, and then again, it's mapped in the prelude. So you can, you can use it 
you can use the replace. Um, all right, so then you have um, what what else you need? Uh, as I was, uh, those of you who watched the video, I talked about it in the video. Um, I when I'm programming, I usually have a pen and paper as well with me. So I'm not only using a laptop and a keyboard. I also have kind of a pen and paper just so so I can take some quick notes and I can take some quick pointers for myself uh, and to keep track of like where I was in my mental process. Uh, I also like to scribble, so that's something that that you kind of could adopt uh, yourself. And then um, that's that's all you need to do Haskell programming. So um, you have, um, let me unfold this. So we have a compiler, we have the um, IDE, we have the REPL, which we, once it finishes, yeah. So um, what is the REPL? REPL is, uh, if you were doing programming in, um, JavaScript, especially in the browser, you're familiar with the kind of a command line uh, interpreter where you can issue some commands and get some uh, values out. Uh, in Haskell, you have the same. So when I run, uh, so let me um, let me quick and start again. So I created a project. I'm inside a project, and now I can run a command line interpreter, which will be using all the functions and all the code that I've already written in this project, right? So when I say stack GHCI and I means interpreter, it will kind of bootstrap uh, that interpreter for me. And it will tell me here what, oops, what libraries I have included. So I included the main um, lib uh, and all the paths which are kind of in my project and also tasks. I can show you. So if I go here, um, I can do this. So you will see that I have in sources, I have lib and tasks, which are two modules, uh, which I'm defining what they do. And then in the app, I have the main module, which is the one with the main function, right? So I have kind of three modules main. Uh, lib and tasks. And that's what you see that I, I kind of, the interpreter kind of included here, main, lib, and tasks. Um, this one is basically like the default, everything else that is in there is kind of included. Um, and then you can run some, some commands. So the, the most useful one is a column queue, which means you can quit, right, the, the interpreter. Uh, another useful one is T, and T asks, what is the type of something, right? So for example, I have a function called fizz and I can ask, okay, um, no, 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 then this one, then this one, I don't have it. It's in the lecture three here. What I, let's see, what do we have? I have dummy bool. So let's call uh, or double num. So I can ask, what is the type of double num? Uh, and it tells me, okay, double num is a function which takes an int and returns an int, right? Um, and I can run it. So I can say double num and let's say four and it, it replies with eight. So I can kind of interactively test some of the things or some of the code that, that I've already written uh, in the interpreter. Um, I can use the, like, for example, I can say, what is the type of replace? Uh, and it says replace is not in the scope, right? So replace is not defined in any of the libraries that I'm using, and it's not defined in prelude. So I would need to import uh, a module which has replace. Uh, so to do that, um, I would need to, where is the browser? Not this one, where did we lost? Yeah, here. So if I go to Hugo and I find this replace, I can see it's, it's in the foundation string, right? Foundation string defines a replace. So to be able to use it, I would have to say 
I want to use foundation string. Uh, foundation. Um, right, so. Um, in Golang, when we want to use a particular dependency, what do we do? We say in the uh, dot mod file, the go mod, we say we want to use that particular module. And then in our source code, we say import and we use that particular module, right? In, in, um, in Haskell, it's the same. So I cannot import it here because I didn't say that this dependency is part of the dependency of the, of the project. And those dependencies you define in the package YAML, right? So in the package YAML, you define what are the dependencies of your project such that uh, you, can, you, you can use them. So in here, if I were to use a foundation string, I would have to add it as a dependency. And then I would be able to kind of import stuff from that uh, particular dependency. But the foundation string is not, it, this is like a namespace name. It, it doesn't mean the foundation string is in that module, right? So I need to find, um, I would need to find where, oops, where is foundation string defined? And to do that, I, um, it jumps to, yeah, so foundation string. Um, Yeah, let's do another one. So Hackage is a repository of all the packages that exist in Haskell. And then if I say foundation string, No, it doesn't find me that. Let's try to replace. So it will be called strings or something like this. Yeah, there is 245 entries. Um, Okay, let's try foundation. Right, so the foundation is an existing package and it has foundation string module included. Which means in my dependencies, what I would have to say is I am including foundation. So if I include foundation uh, and I quit that, I don't remember what was the key combination for reloading uh, my project configuration file. For reloading your code, you just say reload and then it reloads your source files um, and rebuilds what needs to be rebuilt. And you have the new definitions of functions kind of included. Uh, but for the for that one, I don't. And as you see, it's kind of a fetching basement and it will fetch foundation as well. And that will take a while because it's lots of stuff, lots of uh, modules. And once it's done, it, I will be able to in, include this uh, replace function in my uh, interpreter. So let's continue. So you have the interpreter, uh, you have the Hugo, you have the Hugo and Hackage, Hackage for looking up packages and Hugo for looking up the functions and all the documentation. Uh, and you have your notebook. Excellent. So then uh, we're ready to do some um, 
we're ready to do some programming. And the question for you is whether you already have everything installed. Um, if you don't, then use the time, uh, just install stack uh, and open up your IDE and install the plugin that you're gonna use. If you're using codes, you can in, in, um, include uh, Haskell and then I will fire up IntelliJ and let me check what do I use in IntelliJ. I mostly program in IntelliJ for Haskell, um, but I run and test things in command line. Um, and I'm using the IDE mostly as an editor and not as a kind of a environment to run things. And I do often use the interpreter to test, uh, to play with some of the constructs, especially because Pascal has a little bit of a, a unusual syntax and you want to check, like you want to test uh, what, you know, whatever uh, syntax you're using, whether it's correct or not. So let me, Projects. Uh, I'm normally using a different laptop. So uh, this is not my usual setup for um, preparing and programming. Uh, I use this one for, um, yeah, lectures. Okay, so let me show you. Okay, I need to quit. Screen mode. Okay, so I'm importing a project in uh, IntelliJ and it says, okay, uh, what project is that? And you you kind of need to pick Haskell stack uh, because it's a stack-based project. So uh, if you have different options, pick Haskell stack uh, and then you will have to add stack executable um, and it will wire itself up with the new, uh, with the project. So I, I'm, I'm doing it for this fellow Haskell uh, at the moment. Um, and it basically is taking some time, but it's like the, uh, the project is being open and wired up. While it's doing that, I will check uh, what plugin I'm using here. Uh, IntelliJ has, historically has two uh, Haskell plugins. Uh, one is um, a little bit more stack-based. Uh, the other one was a bit more generic and working with Cabal. Um, and I, I will tell you which one is which, but it, it's taking some time. Yeah, I probably should not be doing multiple things at the same time. Making things worse, I guess. Yeah, so as I said, this is not my usual laptop. Uh, I'm not sure even if I have this one installed. Let's see. So I do have Golang. But and Rust. But I don't uh, have the one. No, I do have. Yeah, so the one that I recommend you using is IntelliJ dash Haskell. Um, the problem with Haskell on IntelliJ is that you should not use multiple plugins for Haskell. You should only use one. Uh, with uh, code, I, I, I don't think there are more than one. So all the extra ones you can combine uh, with the main one. But here um, it had two. So if I search, uh, if I search for Haskell, there were two big ones. Um, so one is called IntelliJ Haskell, and sort by 
Right, so if I search by downloads, all right. Um, yeah, so I think that one wins by far anyway. Um, I don't, I don't remember if it was Task Force or some other name. Maybe it was Task Force, uh, but. Um, IntelliJ dash Haskell is kind of the, the de facto one that works well and it works well with stack. So it has kind of a good stack integration. Uh, I tried the other one, maybe it was Task Force uh, two years ago uh, and it worked okay, -ish, but it had some, some uh, quirks and then you couldn't bo do both. So um, just install one and then it will kind of probably do everything you need. Uh, so it, it, it seems I'm using that one and um, it will kind of wire itself up properly. And um, when you importing the project, then you can um, tell it that it's a stack project and then it will work. Um, I tend to generate projects from command line, not from the IDE, uh, because I have a bit more control of what happens. Uh, but it should be okay if you uh, initiate the project from your ID as well. As I said, um, yeah, this laptop is a bit overloaded now, uh, but in, in general, programming in Golang is faster in terms of uh, responsiveness of the ID and everything. Uh, Haskell tends to be a little bit more uh, heavy. Uh, so you need to be a little bit more patient with, um, with waiting for things, but it seems, um, it kind of wired itself up correctly, and then you can um, you can uh, see the syntax highlighting and and do stuff with it. We will come back to that in a like uh, after the break. I will show you uh, how we do comments and how we do kind of a test. It, it was in the video um, a little bit as well. So it would be good if you kind of uh, settle for what uh, you want to use. If you want to use Vim or Code or IntelliJ. Uh, and then I install stack, generate some simple project for yourself, and then uh, we can um, continue um, with the development. So let me let me move on, and then we'll have a, let me do two more slides, and then we'll have a break. Um, and while while in the in the break, uh, you can. Um, you can install what you need to install. And then if something doesn't work, you ask me. All right, so um, in terms of Haskell, um, what I would like you to do this week is to kind of uh, get to understand the, uh, the basic syntax. Yeah, my laptop is really struggling. I may need to quit things. So let's quit that. Let's quit that too. Yeah, so it complained that it couldn't start the repo. That's okay. All right, so first question to you all and to Zoom people, what's the difference between function definition and function declaration? Are they the same? Yeah. Perfect. So uh, paraphrasing it. So the definition is the implementation of the function, what it does. And declaration is just kind of declaring the name and the parameters and what it returns, right? Um, so uh, re remember that. Um, so uh, in, in Haskell, um, we have um, some basic syntax, which is a little bit different to what you used to from C, C++ type of languages or even Golang. Uh, and then we kind of expressing the logic of the code using those, uh, th those basic syntax um, uh, structures. 
So we have functions, we have function patterns, uh, we have function guards, uh, which we can use to define functions. Usually function patterns and function guards not exist in other programming languages. Uh, we don't have them in Rust or Golang or, or C++, uh, but we do have them here. Uh, if you ever program prolog or some other functional or logic based programming, you may have function patterns. Um, then we have kind of uh, expressions and statements. Um, and then we have brackets, which group things for us and kind of a dollar sign, which is another thing that kind of uh, groups um, functions. So in normal, um, in normal programming, uh, we have some statements and then we have end of line or semicolon, and then we have another statement, right? Um, and that's very typical saying to the computer, do this and then do this and then do this, right? Um, in normal programming, like in C++, you can, you can say, do this and this function returns something. And then this something that it returns is a input to another function. So we say function, uh, let me just type. So we could, we could have something like this. Um, so in, um, in normal programming, we say function, function, function. And that's usually how we structure the code, right? We have some do this, do this, do this, right? But if I have two functions and I have function two, which takes a para as a parameter, the output of function one, I can do this, right? So this is, we, we sometimes see that, right? So I uh, would have to do this, right? So we say F2 takes the output of F1, uh, which does something and then returns it and then it's consumed here, right? Uh, and if I have a function three, uh, which takes what F2 did, I would do this, right? But you don't see this a lot, right? In a, in a normal C++ code, you don't see structures like this a lot. But in functional programming, you see that a lot. Uh, why? Because in functional programming, we always kind of produce something by a function and we consume something by another function. So the functions and passing parameters or passing values by returning things from another function and feeding it to another is a very common pattern. So this is a very common pattern in functional programming where one function takes whatever another function produced, right? Um, in, in structured programming, we kind of do the same, but we, we do it in a different way. What we do is we usually say, A is what F1 produces, right? And then B is what F2 produces, taking A as a parameter. And then C is what F3 will produce, taking B as a parameter, right? We sometimes do this, right? But in, in structured programming, we kind of uh, organize our things by having kind of intermediate state as a variable somewhere and then passing it around. Uh, whereas in, in uh, kind of a functional programming, we tend not to introduce those extra variables. We tend to do this. And because we tend to do this, the syntax is kind of a simplified by kind of a calling by like a composing functions by space, right? So I can kind of do it uh, like this, right? So F, F2 takes whatever F1 produced uh, and then F3 takes whatever uh, F2 produced, but then again, you have some parameters, right? So now it looks as if F3 takes two parameters, but it, it, that's not, the case, right? So again, we would need to use brackets or we, we would need to use some sort of a delimiter of telling like what, um, what is it that this function takes? Uh, so, and there are kind of a two ways of doing it. One, one way of doing it is by dot, uh, by composing a function saying, um, I have now a function which takes one parameter, which is first fed to F1, and then whatever that produced is fed to F2. Um, so th this is kind of Haskell, Haskell syntax. Um, or I can do it by, uh, if I only have two, then that would work. If I have more than two, or if F1 takes some parameters, I would have to use a dollar sign, or I would have to delimit it. 
like this. So, okay, let's say F1 takes an integer, right? So I have F1, which takes an integer and produces an integer. And then F2 is also a function which takes an integer and produces an integer. And then F3, F3 is a function which takes an integer and produces a string, right? Then um, if we don't use the um, structured like a imperative programming, but we do this, then I could call it like this. I, um, I would say 12, right? So F, F1 takes 12, it produces another integer which is fed as a parameter to F2. And then F2 produces another integer which is fed to F3. And then eventually I have some, I don't know, hello world out, right? Uh, I have some string um, which is produced by F3. Um, so this is, I, I can call it like this in Haskell. Uh, and in Haskell, that would be F3, open bracket, F2, open bracket, F1, and F1 takes 12, right? The parameters to a function, they, they, they don't use brackets in, in Haskell. So that would be kind of legal statement in Haskell. Um, and we can simplify it by saying, um, I can replace the last uh, last bracket. So I can do this. So now I have F2 will take whatever F1 with 12 produces, and then F3 takes the, the outcome of this computation. And then I can remove this brackets and have a dollar sign like this, right? Um, so then that's like how you can, you can do that, or you could compose it and say, I have a function composition, which produces a new function. So now this, the whole thing is a single function, which takes one parameter, which is an integer and produces uh, a string, right? So this becomes a function composition of a type uh, of a type which takes an int and produces a string. And I am passing 12 to it, right? And then I don't need any brackets or any, any dollar signs. Um, so this kind of composing of, of functions is kind of a very typical for, um, for, um, for Haskell and, and for functional programming in general. And that's why we have this brackets and dollar and sign kind of thing. And function composition, I, I spent some time discussing and then carrying, um, I will talk a little bit more, um, I will talk a bit more about carrying um, either on Wednesday or next week. Okay, so let's have a break. Uh, let's have 10 minutes break um, until 1, 1.25. So everybody will chill out a little bit. Come on, 10 minutes, all right. And I will check if this finished, yeah, that finished. All right, any questions during the break? In the chat.
Excellent. So let's continue. Um, all right. So right now, everyone should have it start installed. If not, um, make sure that you do it. Uh, and don't don't wait for working on Haskell before, like after you do everything in, in Golang. Uh, you have to do two things at the same time. So you have to do Golang and Haskell at the same time. So the assignment two for Golang kind of overlaps with you already working on Haskell. Um, Okay, so let's let's continue. Um, as I said, um, there are some basic syntax uh, elements that um, sort of uh, important, and um, we we talked about function de declaration, function definition, um, and let's talk a little bit more about uh, some kind of a fund fundamentals. So if I open code, okay. So before I open code. Um, what I will do is I will kind of create a new project from scratch. So I will go one level up and I will say stack, stack new first. Um, first is not the best name, uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe demo project. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start a demo project, uh, and then I will um, go into demo project and explain a little bit about the structure of the folders. So, <clears throat> as you see, uh, stack new generates kind of like a template uh, placeholder, and it has a couple of uh, folders. Uh, the first one is called app. And that's where the main uh, main package lives. And the main package is um, kind of like a placeholder for the entry point, right? So same as with other programming languages, the entry point is a function called main. Um, uh, yeah, let let maybe it will be easier if I uh, show you in code. So because then I can scale the fonts and make it bigger, easier. So the app folder is where the main package lives, main module, uh, because the whole thing is a package. The, the module are the ones which with, with kind of a namespace. Um, so if I make it bigger, yeah. So we have an app folder and inside app folder, we have this uh, main, um, main module. And the main module is called main with capital M. Uh, and it has a function called main with small m. And this function is the entry point to, to running the executable. Um, it has to be in the main package and it has to be called main. Uh, and it has to have the signature, um, which is an IO action. We will talk about IO actions later. Uh, so don't worry about this. Um, this uh, colon colon uh, notation represents the type declaration right so this line this line uh, represents a declaration of the function name what parameters it takes and what returns value it has it doesn't take any parameters and it returns value has an io action uh, and this line is the function definition so it's kind of defines what this function does and this function what it does is basically calls a sum func Right, and the sum func is taken from the lib module, uh, and the lib module lives in source. So source is where all your code lives, and that's where you will be implementing everything. And you can organize it into modules, and the the module is given by the typically by the file name uh, and the the kind of the module name. Right. So if I go into lib, you will see that lib is a module called lib, um, and then. In round brackets, you you uh, define or oh, declare all the functions that you want to export. Remember, in Golang, exporting be beside a package um, 
which is called module here. Yeah, the terminology is a bit confusing. Uh, so the, um, the, the namespaces in kind of in Golang are called packages, right? Here, the whole thing is called package and the namespaces are kind of called modules. <laughs> so it's the opposite. Um, so in Golang to expo export something outside, you just co capitalize the, the first letter. Here, you uh, don't capitalize things because uh, Haskell has a different conventions. You capitalize types. So all the types in Haskell have capital letters. As you've noticed like int before or IO action has capital letters, right? Functions have small letters and variables have small letters. Uh, and language syntax like where and so on has small letters. Um, types have capital letters. <clears throat> so to export something outside of lib, we have to include it in this kind of around brackets after the lib, right? It, like whether I wrote it in a single line uh, or whether it's written like this, it doesn't matter, right? So it's, it's kind of the same if I, if, I wrote it, uh, if I wrote it like this, um, it's like the, the punctuation doesn't matter. If I remove that space, it doesn't matter either. If I have two functions, so let's say I have another function called uh, uh, f2, be very creative. Uh, and that function takes an int and returns an int, right? Uh, and we, that's the de declaration and we define it saying, okay, it takes an x and the function basically is defined as x plus x then x plus x, then I can say, I don't want this. And I want to export it as well, I would use comma. So I would say, okay, export some func and F2, right? So each function has a declaration and the definition, and then the comments are with the kind of a minus minus. Uh, and typically we use minus minus and then like the vertical bar to de uh, de uh, declare or kind of describe what the function is. It's like the help system will use this vertical bar to group the comments as a kind of a description, right? So we can say F two doubles the given number, okay? So that's how we write the functions, that's how you write the comments. <clears throat> uh, and the function is defined by this equal sign. So it says uh, the left-hand side is the name of the function on the parameter list. And then the right-hand side is the behavior. Um, we don't use semicolon. Uh, we use brackets to group things uh, depending what we want to achieve. Um, we also have, let's, let's write another function. So let's call it, um, um, yeah, in the, in the video, I use a uh, function swap three, which was basically taking um, a list of three elements and swapping the first and the third element, right? So let's, let's not to repeat ourselves, let's call it swap two. Uh, and this function, what it will do is it will take a list uh, of items uh, and it will return um, another list of items, right? So it takes a list and returns a list, um, but the, the two elements are swapped. Uh, so I will not uh, declare what types it, it is. I will just uh, want to specify how I want to do it, right? So we want to take a list and we want to return a list, but if the list, Let's say if the list is uh, one, 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 one. if the list is um, one and two, we want to return returns two and one, right? We want to swap the the, the elements of the list, and we only want the the function to take a list with two elements. If the list is one element or zero elements or three, we want to return an empty list, right? So to do that, 
we can use pattern uh, pattern matching on functions. So we can say what happens if the swap two gets an empty list, right? So if swap two gets an empty list, we say it returns an empty list. Okay. Uh, so that's one uh, one case statement or kind of one case that we have to deal with. Uh, if we get a list with one element, what should the function return? Well, the, the function should return an empty list as well, right? So we say, okay, if the function gets empty list, it returns an empty list. If the function gets one element, it returns an empty list. What if the function gets, um, if the function gets two elements? So it gets A and B. Uh, then we want to return B and A, right? Uh, we want to swap them. Uh, and then for anything else, so if the function gets whatever else, which means something else, more than two elements, we return an empty list, right? So now we have a, we declare the function by declaring it four times, right? We declared four different cases uh, of what the parameter will could be, and then we we declare the behavior of what the function will do, right? Um, it's not very common that we write code like this, but in this particular case, it kind of makes sense because it's very readable. Uh, it's easy to understand the logic. Uh, and it's also easy for us to swap the, the two items by doing this line, right? What is this line called? Like wh what we are doing here? How is it called? Okay, uh, Zoom people. Any ideas? I give you a hint. Let's say I have a function in Golang. Um, I'm not very creative, <laughs> uh, which is called F2. Uh, and it's declared as this. So I, I say func. I have func F2, which takes, um, I don't know, it takes an integer. Uh, and then in, it returns two integers as a, as a tuple, right? Something like this, right? And like for the sake of uh, implementation, let's, uh, let's return a, a, right? So it basically is a function which returns me a tuple of du doubling the, the same value twice, right? And then I have a, I, I'm, I'm trying to call it. So I can call um, it is f2 with two, right? So what it will do, it will red equals now two, 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 correct? You agree with this? That's, that's what in Golang we, we, it will happen? Fantastic. So what if instead of red, I do this? F2. Can I do this in Golang? I can do it. And then I will have X and Y being 2, 2, right? And what is it called? Instead of doing this, instead of doing this, okay, let's, let's call it X, X, Y, like this, a single tuple. I'm doing this. How is it called? Oh, come on, it will be in the exam. <laughs> it's called destructuring. Uh, let me write it. Destructuring, right? I have a structure and I'm decomposing that structure to kind of uh, substitute some of the things out of the structure into individual variables. And then I can use them individually, right? So I'm kind of doing this structuring and the same I'm doing here, right? So here in Haskell, I'm saying, well, this function will take a list, but it will happen that this list will be of two elements. And I want to assign the first element to A variable and the second element to B variable, right? And I have A and B being substituted with the actual elements of the list. And I'm kind of destructuring the list into the A and B. And then I'm creating a new list by swapping them, right? So I'm putting whatever was 
first at the first position and then the second. And here I can manipulate, I can use X and Y separately because I can already substitute it X and Y, right? So here uh, X, Y is a tuple, right? But here X and Y are just integers because I already destructured them. All right, so that's, um, that's pretty nice. Uh, we, have, um, we have patterns, functional patterns, and we have uh, destructuring. So not only the, the, the compiler will work out what patterns should call which behavior, it will also allow us to do destructuring here, right? Um, we, could, um, we could change this implementation. Oops, uh, why it highlights it? Because it says your implementation is incomplete, which means you have certain cases of what can be passed to this function, but you didn't exhaustively define the behavior for all possible things that this function can take, right? So uh, if I call, so if I leave it like this and I call swap uh, to, we have an empty list, the behavior is known because that's the behavior that will return an empty list. If I pass it with one, two, or oh, one, uh, 12 and 13, it will return 13, 12. But if I pass it with three arguments, the behavior is unknown, right? Because I didn't define the behavior. What will happen if I pass a la larger list to this function? So because of that, the IDE is complaining, saying, okay, you have an unknown exhaustive definition of a function. So I have to define the behavior for all the remaining cases. And I'm doing, I'm doing it by this. And now the, the behavior is, um, is, the, is well defined for all possible cases. And then if you don't want to specify the name of a variable uh, for binding, then you can use underscore, same as in Golang. It's exactly the same. Um, yeah, it has some, some issues. You will have a lot of uh, type issues and, and, and compiler issues with Haskell. Um, which is kind of um, a little bit un unusual, let's say, for um, dynamic languages or even for C++, where a lot of time you, your program compiles but doesn't behave as you intend. Here, a lot of times your program will not compile. Uh, and the moment you get your program compiling, almost 99.9%, 90, .9 it will do what you want it, right? Uh, there are some occasional things that your program compiles and then some un weird behavior happens, uh, but it's very unusual. Usually you fight with the compiler and then once the compiler is happy, then your program is correct. Um, okay, so this is, um, this is uh, some of the stuff that I've done. And as you see, the ID suggests that my, uh, declaration of the function is that it takes a list of something and returns a list of something, right? I didn't specify it myself, it kind of inferred it. Uh, and that's kind of an uh, important point that you can um, skip sometimes the declaration of the function and the um, compiler will infer what it is. It doesn't mean the function doesn't have a type. Everything in Haskell has a type. It's strongly typed language but you don't have to declare the type yourself. Uh, if you want to, you can. So for example, I can say swap2 is a function which takes a list of some sort and returns a list. Um, okay, you may ask what is A here? Uh, is it a variable? Uh, and the, the answer is it's not a variable, it's a type variable. Um, it's a variable for a type. I didn't specify what type that list is. If I want to say it's a list of integers, uh, I would say this, right? And then note the capital I. So if I say uh, function swap takes a list of integers and returns a list of integers, then this code would work. But if I call it, so if I call it with um, one, and three, it will produce, you know, it will produce um, three and one, three and one, that would work. But if I call it with swap and I call it with A character and B character, it will not work. 
uh, because swap uh, swap two doesn't take a list of characters. It only takes a list of integers, right? Does it make sense? But because the behavior is generic, right? Like if I want to swap two integers or if I want to swap two characters uh, or if I have a tuple, right? Maybe I want to call it with a tuple. So I have a swap two and I have a list of two tuples and I have, let's say, tuple like this and another tuple like this. And I want to swap them in the list. You know, my implementation will be exactly the same. I would kind of repeat the same function and just change this type, right? Uh, so in Haskell, it's very natural to do kind of a generic programming saying, well, if your behavior is kind of generic, independent of the type, you can just do it on any type. And then instead of saying int, I can say whatever, whatever type I pass in, right? And then you use a type variable. Uh, typically, we start type variables from A, and then if we need to use more than one, we say B or C. Uh, and um, but it doesn't matter. I, I can say type variable T and type variable T. It just tells the compiler whatever type list is this. The list which comes out is the, of the same type, right? Which means um, I cannot, for example, expect. So if I have a list of integers on input, I cannot expect a list of strings on the output, right? That would not be correct. Uh, and I would have to say a different type, right? So I would have to say, if the type on input is integers and the type of output is strings, I would have to say N and B because they are not the same. But if they are the same, they, then I use A, right? Um, we will talk a little bit more about type system and type variables later. Um, but this declaration basically means um, this A is a type variable and it says whatever type list it, that is, the output is the, the list of the same type. This variable, however, is just a, like a variable. It's, it's got bound to a parameter being passed inside the list, right? So if the list has one item, this item gets bound to A and then I can do something with it. Um, because I'm not doing anything with it. In fact, I can say, I don't care what that is. I just say it's a list with one item and I don't care what it is because I'm not doing anything with it. So I can sub underscore it, yeah? Uh, yes, we, you can do that. It's not a vertical bar. Uh, it's uh, so let's let's do that. Um, so let's say we want for a larger list, uh, we want to only swap the first two, right? So we want uh, to have a pattern which says, uh, I want to take the first two elements of the list and then I don't care what's after. Uh, so we can do this. We can say swap two and we can say, I want to take the first one and the second one. Um, uh, and then I don't care what the uh, I don't care what the rest what the third one is. Um, yeah, that's not what you were asking. So let's do this. Uh, yeah. So this pattern uh, basically bounds binds the first element of the list to A, and the rest of the elements to A S. Uh, again, the names are unimportant. You can name them whatever they, they are, but the convention is if you have multiple, like if you're taking part of the list, which is a list, you we usually say S being plural in English, saying that this is like the, the rest, the tail, right? So in, in, in fact, this A is a head of the list and AS is the rest, the, the tail of the list. And then you can do something here. Uh, so what we could do is we could say, uh, take uh, the head of the AS and combine it with um, A and then forget about the rest, right? We could do this, right? So we, for larger lists, we just take the first two elements, we swap them, we return it, and then the, the rest of the list disappears. In which case that pattern is redundant because that would never be hit, right? Um, the, the compiler 
works out the logic from top to bottom and it checks if one of those patterns is met by the call and then if it's met then it executes the right hand side and if it doesn't then goes down and then because uh, we exhausted the pack the the, uh, the patterns the, the last one now is kind of um, will never be hit right so this is an operator uh, which concatenates an element to a list um, so if you have two lists uh, so so this this operator takes an element and the list and returns the list with this element being the head of the new list right uh, if you have two lists so if I say a an empty list that means I have created a list with one element right if I have if I say a one then I would kind of create a list like this make sense and then if you have two lists uh, to concatenate it there is an, a different operator which is plus plus right so that one takes a list and the list and produces a new list uh, so for example if I have a list of element a and list of element B, then this one will create A and B, right? And then if I, uh, this, this function, this plus plus function cannot be used in this structuring, but this uh, colon operator can be used as a destructuring operator to kind of uh, separate the head and the tail of the list for me. Um, the, the, um, the notation is slightly different because you don't use the round bracket, uh, the square brackets as a list. You, you're kind of uh, just doing it as a, yeah, this, this does, the, the ID doesn't complain, but very likely you would have to use the enclosure for it to not get confused, right? Um, so if you're destructuring a list, you're using the square brackets. If you kind of are uh, destructuring the list into individual elements, but if you want the, the head and the tail, you kind of just do it, do it destructuring like this. All right, so um, this is the, um, the fundamentals of declaring a functions um, in, um, in Haskell, everything, almost everything is a function and the functions and constants are polymorphic such that you can kind of have different types, um, different things kind of being casted to different types. And also you can have, um, you can kind of uh, assign functions to functions. So for example, if you want, so let's say we declared um, F2, so let me, let me delete that. So let's call F2 a sum, right? And let's say uh, sum takes two integers and returns an integer. And it basically says, um, it basically is like this, right? So sum takes X and Y and returns the X plus Y. Uh, that would work fine and that would work for integers, right? But the plus operator is also defined for floats or for any integral type. Uh, so in fact, what you could do is you could say, I don't care what type you pass to me, right? Let's try that. Let's try not caring about the type. Um, and then if we go to if we go to demo project and say uh, stack run, it compiler compl complains. It says, well, uh, in the expression x plus y, uh, you um, uh, you are trying to use a plus on a type that is not a number, right? Because I said, I don't care about the type of, of what I'm adding. And it complains that uh, there is no instance of a plus operator to be able to do it on any type. We can only do plus on numbers, right? So that means we have to 
uh, change a little bit our constraint and we have to say uh, a is a number and we do it like this so now I'm, I'm saying i'm telling the compiler look i don't care what a is as long as a is some sort of number and num is not a type it's like a type class which defines a set of types which have a certain property for which plus is defined right um, and now if we if we try to compile it uh, then it will uh, then it will work so now i const I, I i still can call it with floats and i can call it with yeah we renamed it to some uh, so we have to say this one is the sum. Um, so as long as the type that I'm passing has a, a num type class, then it will then it will work fine. Oh come on. Um, maybe there is some. Yeah, so the the sum is already defined in prelude, and then I have a name conflict between my defined function and um, the other one. So let's call this one sum Marius, sum Marius, uh, sum Marius, and then it will work fine. Um, that the the tick operator, uh, like the 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 single quote. Um, is often used to differentiate what you defined with what is in prelude, right? So uh, another way of, of doing that would be if I renamed it to a single quote and single quote and single quote. And that looks weird because usually single quote is not a valid character in uh, variable names or function names in other languages, but in, in, in Haskell it is uh, perfectly legal. Uh, and then it would also work fine, right? So now it doesn't complain. It kind of prints some punk uh, because that's what we print. Um, let's print hello world instead. And that will work fine. Okay. Um, so if I have this function like this, uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking two parameters and then I'm implying a plus function on top of that of that um, function, right? Uh, you notice that the uh, plus op, uh, function kind of takes a left hand side and right hand side. That's a little bit unusual uh, because usually a functions are called like this. Like you have a function called let's say f, and it's like parameter one, parameter two, right? You you have a list of parameters kind of on the right hand side of the function. So most functions are like this and then if you would like to call uh, let's say i have p1 p2 and then if you want to call p1 f p then you can do that but you need to use that kind of a backtick so if you if you say backtick then what it means it uses a normal function which takes parameters uh, on the right hand side and you can use it in this sort of uh, infix notation right so you have a prefix postfix and infix notation uh, this is an infix which means it's kind of in the middle of the left and the right hand side right um, we have a, a kind of a prefix um, i can have you know p1 p f where the function is at the end so that's postfix right it's uh, after the arguments, or I can have it prefix, or I can have it infix, right? Um, when we have infix, um, if some, func some functions are infix, like plus is infix, but I can still use um, I can still use plus as a um, as a uh, prefix if I do that right so even though i can use plus as an infix without the ticks i can also use it as a prefix and then yeah you get the you get the idea so now if i wrote, wrote it like this 
which means, uh, let's write it properly. So I'm passing X and Y to plus, right? Um, uh, what, um, what Haskell has, it's called, um, 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 point free notation. And it means I can remove the parameters if the declar like the left hand side of my definition um, has the same number of parameters which the right hand side of the definition, right? So effectively what it means is that I can delete those X and Y and delete those X and Y and define sum as a, as a plus on whatever is being passed to that function. So sum takes two numbers, uh, A and B, or you know, X and Y, and basically does plus on them. Uh, and this, this is exactly the same definition as I had before, right? So um, if I uh, write it again, uh, X, or let's call it A and B. And then uh, equals a plus b. Those two lines are exactly the same. They they literally are exactly the same for the compiler. Um, and that means also that uh, often what happens is let's say I have uh, let's say I want to have a function which takes um, a list and returns the length, right? Um, so I can call like my length. Um, so I have a, a, a function called a len tick, uh, which takes a list of some sort. Uh, so I can say list and it returns um, the length of the list, right? Um, and now if I save it, um, I can change the definition of this by deleting this parameter and this parameter because the left-hand side and the right-hand side take exactly the same parameter. So it, it's kind of a redundant. Um, it's a little bit weird to read code like this because it appears as if len doesn't take any parameter, right? Uh, but in fact, len is still defined uh, as taking, um, as taking, uh, so if I look at the type, it will be still like this, right? It still takes an, uh, a list and returns the int, which is the, the length of that list. Okay, um, let's very quickly, we going a little bit over time. So let's go back to the, um, to our mentee and I have some uh, quiz questions for you. And then we will finish for today. So please work. All right. So that is, that's not a quiz. That's just like a questionnaire. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping the people who are responding partially actually are uh, understanding it quite well. Um, most of the things I already discussed, they might be some like edge cases, but uh, the patterns for the functions and the, um, the destructuring is pretty simple. Uh, there is not much beyond what I covered. So that's, let's hope that's good. All right, so that, then there is a first quiz question. Okay, we only have four questions. So, and each is like 20 seconds. I didn't talk about it. So this will help people who um, pay attention. Even though I didn't talk about it, uh, it was on one of the slides. Yay. 
So majority of people kind of understood understood it well from the slides. Uh, so very quickly, let's uh, have a very quick detour. Um, so if statement in most programming languages, if you know condition, then something, and then um, the ver variant with else. In most languages, is a language construct. It's not an expression. Uh, in Haskell, that is an expression. You can always uh, uh, assign it to something, right? You can say, using Golang-like notation, you can say A is whatever that expression evaluates to. And what it evaluates to, evaluates to something if the condition is true or else uh, to something that, that uh, when the condition is, is false, right? Um, so in Haskell, you have to have else because, because it is an expression, it always has to have a value out of it, coming out of it, right? Uh, and because it's an expression, uh, this can be just like an expression that you can say two, right? Else two, right? So you can say if condition, then one, else two, or, um, you know, a variable name, right? So instead of declaring behavior in the then else closes, you define a value, right? What comes out, right? It's not a behavior. The behavior is the con conditional matching, but the outcome is kind of a value, right? So it always evaluates the next to a value because, because it is an expression. Um, all right, so uh, next one. <laughs> okay, that's like a quiz again. Great, so th those people who think only partially understand it, uh, ask me questions or propose questions on the Discord or issue tracker. Um, all right, next one, a where. Um, you have seen where close once um, already, if you paid attention to slides. Um, this one is more tricky. But let me quickly show you where have you seen where? All right, so where is a syntactic sugar? Uh, it's kind of, uh, you've seen where here, you see? So we said module, blah, 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 where, and then we defined stuff, right? Uh, in function definitions, uh, we do the same. So for example, we can say some, uh, let's call it like F2 uh, takes X equals, equals Y where, and then I can say Y equals, you know, it's, uh, y is 21, right? Uh, so this where here de defines a section where I can define some of the things which I used kind of in the left-hand side before the where. Uh, and that's just a syntactic thing. It's not an expression. It's not really a statement. Uh, it's just like a syntactic construct, right? All right, so that's covered. Um, next one. Yeah, this one we should have talked about, but we run out of time. Uh, this one we should have talked about in the context of uh, our pattern matching in the function. So again, I will wait for you to say. Those who watched the video will know, uh, those who didn't will probably not know. Well, case is also an expression. <laughs> so case is also an expression. Uh, and in, um, oh, where is our function? I already deleted it. Trap. Let's see if I can get it back. Um, uh, 
quick, 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 quick. We close. No, not that close. I don't know. Yes, perfect. All right. So we are. Okay, let's see. We have. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, we have the swap tool thing, right? And we define it for empty list for a list with uh, one element. Uh, one element with uh, uh, two elements and so on, right? And I said swap two equals blah, blah, blah. So you can kind of do the same with the case expression saying swap uh, list equals and say case list of, and then um, the case will deconstruct the list into the pattern that we want to match here. And then uh, we will do or return the behavior of what is after the uh, right-hand side of the arrow. Sometimes we define things with the equal. Uh, it's kind of like a math mathematical say, this is the same as this, right? So we're saying this function is the same as the body of the function. But sometimes we do it with the arrow. Uh, and then like, for example, here we wanted to say, okay, return an empty list. Here we wanted to say, return an empty list. And for this, we wanted to say, return um, B and A, right? And then we had this um, otherwise case. Uh, and then otherwise we say, return an empty list, right? So th the case is an expression. Uh, it returns whatever the right-hand side of the matching thing becomes. And then the body of this function becomes what that returns. But does it make sense to you? So case is kind of like a kind of a expression which matches this variable to whatever the left hand side matches happens to be, and then it runs or kind of uh, returns the right hand side, right? Um, so the outcome of this if I pass it a list which is an empty list, will be an empty list. If I pass it a list that has a one element, will be an empty list. If I pass it a list that is two elements, will be the swap, right? And it is an expression. So those people who said it's an expression were correct. Uh, all right, so I have a leaderboard. I have one more question. And then we're done. OK, so let's run one more question. I already told you the answer in the class as well. So that one should be easy. It's false. So the type declarations are um, not compulsory, uh, but it's a good practice to put them yourself, right? So often you can start by typing your function definition and then see what the ID suggests. And if the ID suggests what you think it should suggest, you can type it yourself uh, or leave it. But if the ID suggests something that is like, no, 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 I didn't mean that, I mean this, then you type it yourself. So even though it's not compulsory, it's a good practice to type it yourself such that you control what it becomes uh, because sometimes it's a bit ambiguous. Um, and sometimes you want to be more precise, more concrete with the type than the uh, in, uh, inference engine is, or you want to be more generic. Um, so it, even though it is false, uh, you should write it. There will be cases where the compiler will say, I don't know what you mean. Do you mean this type or this type? And then you have to write it yourself, right? So there will be cases where the compiler will complain and force you to de, like uh, to make the decision. Uh, but uh, most of the time, the, the inference system can uh, infer it itself. 
All right, so we will finish here. Uh, I will continue a little bit because there are a couple of more, a uh, couple of uh, additional things that I want to talk about and I didn't manage. So we will continue this on Wednesday. Uh, make sure you have your environment set up. Uh, make sure you kind of uh, play with the hello Haskell code, which is in the repo. Um, and uh, you don't need to fully understand. Uh, so if you, I close this. Um, I will show you very quickly what you don't need to pay attention to. Uh, so hello Haskell is the, the code base that we kind of working with now. Um, and it is a kind of a good template. You can kind of a copy and paste code from it. Um, and it demonstrates how to use tests. Uh, so for example, in the, some of the primitive function um, declarations that I have there, there, there are kind of a test uh, tests written. Uh, and what you need to do is you will need to copy two things. So one thing that you need to copy is in a package YAML, you have to, to use the tests. You have to, uh, in the uh, test, test section, uh, this section here, you have to uh, define um, that apart from your own module, you're using um, doc test. If you're not using quick test, don't, don't include it. Uh, and then we, we don't use this one. Um, we, we usually use this one and this one. Um, you, you will know when you're using quick test, quick check. Uh, and this one is kind of an underlying um, uh, unit test framework, which will be included with this one. Uh, so you need to add those two lines. And then in the spec, sorry, in the uh, spec HS in test, uh, you have to do a little bit of a wiring which means uh, you um, have to initiate um, this boilerplate. So you kind of need to do, you kind of need to do this. Um, if you're running, like really you want to do this and this, because we're not running the property tests and the unit tests. But it, this code demonstrates all three. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about it on Wednesday. But it demonstrates how to write tests using uh, unit tests, unique property tests, and um, the uh, documentation tests. Um, so yeah, maybe I will spend a little bit more time on Wednesday uh, to go through that. Uh, you, you basically look into it, uh, copy and paste into your project some of the wiring up this, um, this kind of a hardwired. Uh, th this is like a boilerplate that you have to have. And then the tests uh, you can do yourself um, depending what, what sort of you want to test. And then once you, once you do that, then it's kind of straightforward because you can just say stack test and then it will um, automatically run all the tests that you define and you will be able to use this. Um, uh, let me see uh, this. or slip, for example, uh, you will be able to use the, um, this type of testing, right? So this uh, triple um, more than sign is a call to this function. And then the next line says what this function returns. And the testing framework tests that this line is exactly what this line returns, right? Uh, so you can write kind of a test for your own functions. And that's very convenient when you're writing your functions to kind of include uh, tests as part of the documentation. Um, so we, we, I will spend some time on, um, on Wednesday to go, to go over that. So congratulations to Dragon Knight and sorry for going 20 minutes over time. Uh, we will uh, continue on Wednesday. If you have questions, I can stay here. Uh, otherwise you can post questions to Discord or Issue Tracker. Thanks.